Um, Don Dwyer needs no introduction. Long career selling at uh, Hawker Beechcraft um, and also Guardian Jet, which he and his brother founded. And I'm going to hand straight over to Don now. Thanks, Al, and congratulations on your success. It's pretty amazing to see this grow every year. And uh, we were just talking about, I was just said to Brian Moss, you know, the, the people that you have here, like Brian Moss, <laughs> this is a big deal. So um, please, I am one of the very few speakers in the world that actually improves with heckling. Don't, don't worry about that. I'm going <laughs> to, there we go. Um, I want to start with a recap. I want to build on something that, uh, a theme that I heard from Chad Anderson yesterday and Brian Proctor. And uh, this was, I'm sure you all remember my presentation last year, uh, but I started with a recap of 2016. And I started with, in 2016, in the 126 models that my company measures, that we track and analyze, there were 1,647 transactions. Now, that'll be a little different than MBA deliveries or uh, NARA numbers because they don't track the same airplanes, but we're close, and the percentages are very close. 572 brokers in those 1,647 transactions. And my point at the time, in the brokerage community, with no barriers to entry, as Brian said yesterday, the guy that cuts his hair has more qualifications than it takes to, has a more stringent requirements to be a hair cutter than to be a broker, um, we have incredibly varying levels of competence in those 572 brokers. I, in competence in technical, contractual, uh, regulatory issues, financial acumen, um, ethics, certainly. Uh, this year, give you a 1,573 transactions. So while it was, most people say it was a great year, it was for my company, but we, in the models that we measure, slightly fewer transactions. The good news is there were 482 brokers, so it's coming down. You know, we said at the last year we wanted the bottom number to grow and the, the one on the right to go down. So at least the one on the right's going down. It's even more prevalent in the, in the light jet business, um, which I think it's a more serious problem, 408 transactions and 220 brokers. I mean, very, very, uh, and by the way, this is not, you have to align yourself with a big brokerage. Um, I'll, I'll talk about our company just a little bit. We're not the biggest guys in the game, but at 60 transactions, we're one of them. We buy more than we sell. Last year out of the 60 transactions, 36 were purchases. About half of those were new airplanes. So we're, you know, we have some, some weight in the, in the community. But 220 brokers for 408. So this year, 457 transactions, a good year, transactions went up, and there were only 164 brokers. And I, I looked at how did that happen? And I think the easiest way to explain it was, I think a lot of you know Cyrus Segari and Jet Aviva. Cyrus is rolling up a couple companies and putting some together. But what he really did was go out and embrace the community that he sells to, the light jet community. He puts on events. He's at every Citation Jet Pilots Association event. He's, and he really went out and embraced that community, which is something I think we all need to do. Um, so going in the right direction, and moving towards, in that space, I think one of the better models for brokerage. So I'll get on with what Al asked me to talk about. And the, the question, the, the title was, are customers being served by the brokerage community? And I will tell you, across those 572 brokers, it's impossible that they're all served really well. The next thing he asked me is, there's too much data. And the answer to that is emphatically no. Our people, and, and I get this a lot. So we have a, we have a consulting business along with a, uh, along with a brokerage. And so we crunch a lot of data. And I am regularly criticized by brokers, by some brokers, not the guys in this room. The guys in this room, by the way, if they're here, they're fabulous. Um, but I'm regularly criticized for providing too much pricing information to my customers. 
Now think about that. I provide pricing information to my customers. I tell people what airplanes are worth, what the markets are doing, because that informs them and they make better decisions because of the data. We have, at the end of this month, we'll have six full-time researchers. So we have a lot of data, but I get criticized for showing it to my customers. I am not giving this out to anybody that I don't have an exclusive brokerage with. So is there too much data? No. Um, I'm, I'm not sharing it with your customers, but the reason I get criticized is people will say, well, it's harder for us to make money when they know what these airplanes are worth. And I'm sorry, but that's just old school. That's an old model that's not gonna work for much longer. Um, the other question Al asked me, is there enough insight? And I will tell you, that depends. I think across those 572 brokers, yeah, probably not. But there's a lot of insight being gleaned from the data today that the better brokers in this room and around the world are providing. On the data side, oh, Simon Burroughs, I don't think Simon's here, great young broker here, smaller business, so believe me, I love the smaller businesses that are serving their customers well. Simon said to me, data is the new oil. And I thought that was really interesting, and he went on to talk about the insights that he was gleaning from the data and helping his customers. Really, really great approach. Um, but I think there's, it depends on who your broker is. Are you getting the insight? Here's what it boils down to me. There's, and I think everybody does a little of both. There are deal-centric deal -centric brokerages and there are customer-centric brokerages. There's a lot of people out there just churning deals. There is nothing wrong with that. If you are buying or selling an airplane, there's nothing wrong with being a great broker that just goes out and executes transactions flawlessly. Um, what does it take to be a good deal-centric broker? We well, gotta have transactional expertise. So what are you gonna be good at? You gotta understand the value of airplanes. You know, valuation is the cornerstone. That's why I have all these researchers. Valuation is the cornerstone of every good brokerage. So most brokerages aren't covering 126 models from the PC-12 to the 650. And even in, I will tell you that I'm, I'm tracking all those. I think I did a dozen light jet deals last year, about half a dozen probably. Um, so most of our business is the super midsize and above. But wherever you are, and most brokerages tend to focus on a smaller segment than we are, you know, you gotta be good at valuations. You gotta be strong technically. These are complicated airplanes. So you gotta be good at that. Today, you gotta be good at the regulatory issues because one, that's gonna affect valuations, but two, it really affects your customer's experience when in a year they have to change things and invest money in their airplane that they may not get back when they sell it. So understanding regulatory issues is important. And contractual, I'll talk about contractual just for a minute. So we say it differently than Brian said yesterday. I love how he said he wanted a standardized contract. I thought that was really, really good. And I know, um, you know one of our guys is on the board and narrow with him. Um, and I love the idea of the standardized contract. Hard to pull off in this environment. But the way we say it is we are looking for industry standard. We want to negotiate like demons on the commercial, commercial issues in a, in a transaction. But then when we go to contract, we want it to move fast and we want to go to industry standard. We are not trying to gain advantage in the contracting process. And so I think somebody that's a good deal-centric broker has to do that. By the way, there's times I'm a deal-centric guy. Somebody comes to me and says, I just want you to sell my airplane. Stop with the data, <laughs> you know, stop with the, um, you know, I, I don't need a fleet plan. Please sell my airplane. And so this is what I need to be good at. Customer-centric is different. The expectation of the customer, getting lifetime customers. The reason we do it is because, and this is not an idle claim. And the first time I heard my brother say it, I, I said, ooh, should we say that? And then he brought up all the examples where we do it. And anecdotally, I can tell you stories all day long where over the life of the asset, when you buy, how long you own it, how you equip it, looking for market opportunity in the markets, understanding when to sell and what, what's available from the OEMs in the used marketplace. We save people millions of dollars over the life of the asset. So does every good broker. Looking at Brad Harris. Brad has done that time and time again. Um, 
But what is the expectation of a customer-centric brokerage customer? It's very different from go get me the next CJ or go sell my 450. Their expectation is transparency. And this is a hard one for this industry. Without any regulation, without any, I, I love what's going on at NARA. Great thing I heard yesterday, which I hadn't heard about, was the thrust to be an international organization. With no borders on the regulations, there's no reason NARA isn't international, and bravo, Johnny, for, for pushing that. Um, but transparency is a big deal in our industry. Our customers are, we are engaged with us to be their advocate. I saw something yesterday in Brian's presentation that really stuck with me. The expectation of our customer group is there's hidden money in the deals, that somebody's making money they don't know about. The expectation, to me that's, that's extraordinary and wrong, and by the way, this happens in every industry and it eventually filters down to the transparent businesses win. In the maturity of an industry, this is coming. To be customer-centric, you have to be, have an expertise in the total cost of ownership. So not only do I have to do the four on the left that are the, um, what, the, what the deal-centric broker has to do, but now I got to be good at a lot of things. Residual values. So there's a couple great residual value stories. Michael Malfitano is still here. You know, if we looked at... Okay, so, so if we looked at the 10 years prior to 2008, and that included four years of irrational exuberance, but the top 10 models that we sell lost an average of 1.5% over a 10-year period. You bought an airplane in 2007, or 1997, you sold it 10 years later. The 10 models lost an average of 1.5%. Same period for us now, it's, it's, it's double figures. So that's a sea change in the business. But what performed really well? G650. I bought a G650 at $59.5 million. I put five years later, it's now five years later, I got 1,500 hours on the airplane and I go sell it for 54. I'm sorry, 46, 47. Do the math, it's not that, it's not double digits. The new introductions, the Phenom 300, Michael's Phenom 300, the only airplane I know that's, that's really pre-2008 in its residual value reduction, it's more like 3 or 4% a year. Well, that should affect my buying decision. I still like the Lear 75. It's a, it's a great airplane that competes with the 300, eight seats. It does a lot of things well. It's bulletproof. But boy, that if I'm looking at the total cost of ownership, that 3 to 4% a year matters. I've got to understand financial instruments. There's a, a few people here, thank you for their sponsorship of this, from Global Jet. We just did a deal with Global Jet. We represented the buyer and seller. That's something we're doing a lot more now. Something I don't love to do is represent both sides of the deal. By the way, you think transparency is important? Represent both sides of a deal. Well, the guys at Global Jet were brilliant because we had a customer that had leases with more than one financial institution. The guys at Global said, okay, they want out, but you have another customer, can we get them into a lease? And now we got three big companies and a little one working together. And we saved the buyer millions who bought the best airplane in the world, and we saved the seller millions because getting out of a lease can be incredibly restrictive. So understanding financial instruments is more important today there's a whole discussion on leasing, buying, financing, et cetera. That's different. But you've got to be great at that to be a customer-centric broker. Capital planning. We, we, we just love capital planning. We think whether you own a CJ2 or whether you're Walmart, who own more than one airplane, <laughs> um, you, you really ought to be smart about the capital you have invested how long should you own these airplanes? How you should prepare the airplane? Should you be on an engine program? By the way, there's never an easy answer to that question. Depends on the model and time and um, a lot going on in that discussion. But you ought to be good at capital planning. For every Walmart fleet plan we do, 
every annual plan we do with these large customers, I probably do 10, I fly 100 hours a year, should I own my own airplane and charter it? Should I get a fractional? Should I just keep chartering? That's just capital planning. You, you, if you're really involved with your customer and really always put his best interest at heart, you gotta be good at that. And then of course you gotta understand market trends. You know, that's what, that's what I love about our, our researchers is that they're living in these markets. Believe me, I'd love to tell you I'm the smart guy in the business, I'm not. <laughs> these are the guys that live in these markets that tell us what's going on. So go back to that 452 brokers, this, this cottage industry with no regulation that anyone can enter, regardless of their ethics, that I am so tired of brokers sending me emails that say, I'm looking for an off-market 550. I've got three, three airplanes on the market today. Why are you looking for an off-market? It's because they're trying to make money in the middle. I get it, I don't, I'm sensitive to it, I understand that we have to, everybody's gotta make money and sometimes you don't have control of the customer, so I understand it. But this idea of, I see more off-market airplanes today than I, do on, than I do in the listing services. There literally will be more coming across the desk than what's in the listing service. Well, they're on the market. There's no real such thing as an airplane for sale that's off market. I'm sure there's a good reason to do it that I haven't figured it out, but anyways. So if we, if we think across that spectrum of brokers, that Jay is at the top of those 572, Brad is at the top of those, Johnny is at the top of those, Chad, these guys are all, Joe McCarthy, great broker. Um, move your customer to the better brokers. You owe it to your customers. I, I just think that you should expect more for your customer and demand more of your broker than a lot of the people in the industry are currently getting. Thank you. If we can put a slide though up. Oh, we've got a question from Rich. We should just get you your own microphone, Rich. It's be publishing transaction prices? Uh... Well, that's a great question. Of course, you know, it's a leveler, the real estate market. You go down the town hall and you figure it out. Should we publish it? You know, I spend a lot of money to get it and, I, and other people aren't, so no, I'm not anxious to publish what I have, except to my customers. So there's probably a bigger issue than my capitalistic nature, but it wouldn't, I don't know that it'd be a bad thing. I mean, I think it's a leveler. I, it's, it's a little difficult when you publish prices, and, and uh, Brian or Chad alluded to this yesterday. And they said, they said, you can make mistakes when you only hear the price. You hear about a G550 that sold for $15 million. You don't necessarily know, was it damaged? Did it, was it up to regulatory compliance? Was it, you know, was it a horrid looking? So I, I'm afraid that we live in such thinly traded markets. You know, it's an interesting thing about the markets right now. G550s, there's more of them than fives, but it, in October I looked at, we track, we really look hard at the last six months of sales and pricing. In the six months previous to, in October when I looked at it, there were 24 sales of 550s. There were two in the G5 market in six months. That's leveled out a little bit since then. But I'm afraid that, you know, those are really thinly traded markets, so somebody could make a leap if they look at a $9 million G5 and not really understand what that means, and I think that that's probably where the danger in it is. So just to follow up, let's say there's a white tail goes off at a $16 million discount. I think everybody in the industry finds out about it. You were talking about valuation. Um, so wouldn't would everybody, the banks, if... Everybody ha had the same perfect information? Which is, that's a great question. And you know, I, I probably buy more new airplanes than anybody in the world. We're, we're buying 18, 20 new airplanes a year, year in and year out now. Um, I hear pricing that I can't get. I hear about $35 million globals <laughs> and I hear about challengers for unbelievable numbers. And I can't get them. And I think I'm okay at getting the lowest number I can get. So I, I, I don't know, it's, if it was published, 
would it, it would protect the person that overpays. You know, one reason, like we're very sensitive to the vagaries in the marketplace. If, if there's a bunch of whitetails by a manufacturer and I know I'm going to pay X, they sell them all out because they sold them all at X. Well, now they want a million dollars more. Well, it's not really good service to, to buy one of those to my customer because the guy that bought it for a million dollars less, he's the one setting the resale price. So there's probably some merit to it, but, um, you know, people engage us for that. And uh, I don't know, I, I, I'm, I love the idea of transparency, but I, I want to make sure people are educated. And that's harder in this world where, you know, th there's a lot of information flow in this world. There's a lot of people understanding what's for sale and what's not for sale. And, you know, um, it, but man, it's in the weeds. Is it a good buy? Is it a good sales price? It's in the weeds, and you gotta have, you gotta have the time and energy and resources and people to dive down in the weeds to understand the pricing. Any more questions? I covered everything. <laughs> Thank you it's, very no, much. No, no, yes. you haven't. Come back. Uh, Patrick Rafferty, what defines a broker? What defines broker? Yeah, here you go. Yeah, we're a broker. We're we're um, we're we're representing customers and transactions. We, uh, you know, I think we wear a couple hats. I, I know some other companies do. I think we probably marry them better than most. But we're we're a consultancy first. We, we I spend my energy on the consulting time. Matter of fact, even our sales guys, they're charged with customer creation. They're they're charged with bringing in new customers. And we sell the airplanes internally. The easiest thing in a brokerage is selling the airplane. Getting the customer to let you give you an exclusive listing is, is, is the hardest part. So. Brilliant. And a final question from Rene. Do you want to answer that one, Don? Uh, yeah, it could. That's a really good question. If, if we disclose the sales prices, you know, we have, you know, we distribute pricing information to our customer base. But there are customers that don't want to say what they spent on an airplane, and of course we won't distribute that. Um, there's a, it's an interesting thing of how do you find these prices. It's, and I hate to say it, it's horse trading. First of all, the Blue Book and VREF are fabulous. They are, they are stunning in how close they are. You know, they're measuring a lot of models. We, we kind of take it a step further, and we work with with everybody um, and, and try and understand what's happened in a very short, acute period of time. But um, yeah, I don't think publishing, I don't think people would like to see their name. You know, there's, it, one of the things we're seeing right now is, um, you know, GE's sort of the tip of the iceberg. We're seeing a lot of companies shrink their flight departments. We're a lot of scrutiny around should they go to EJM, should they go to FlexJet, NetJet, um, and, it, and it's all related to the optics, which I think that question addresses. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Don. Thanks, Great guys. job. Thank you.